For more videos on people's struggles, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hello and welcome to People's Dispatch. Today, that's June 16, the Communist Party of India Marxist is organizing an all India protest. And this protest has certain demands to the Narendra Modi government. Now, we know that India has been facing a severe crisis with, crisis with respect to COVID-19. The number, it's the fourth in the number of cases. And the government's response, it is imposed lockdown, now the lockdowns is being eased. And the government's response has been widely criticized uh, because it has failed to take, the care, take care of the needs of some of the poorest, some of the most marginalized sections of the population. So it's in this context that the CPIM is conducting this protest. And to talk more about this, we have with us Brinda Karat, Politburo member of the CPIM. Thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure to be here, Prashan. So one of the first things I wanted to ask was, the, I'll just mention the key demands first. One is a cash transfer of nearly 7,500 rupees. That's $100 per month for six months for every single family. A distribution of 10 kilograms of food grains, 200 days of employment under the Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, and an end to the privatization of state enterprises. So could you detail some of these uh, key demands in the context of how the government has been handling this crisis? Well, uh, may I first greet your viewers, and especially those in the United States of America, for the huge pushback against the racist and completely fascistic approach of the police exemplified in the terrible murder of George Floyd and the kind of worldwide protests, particularly across America and in many countries in Europe that we have seen, has really inspired uh, the feeling, I think, across the world that governments are using lockdown to push their agenda, asking us to be physically distant. And of course, we are. We are conscious of the need to protect lives. But at the same time, the we all right-wing governments are pushing their agendas during lockdown. I think the fight back against racism and the Trump administration's policies I think it was very inspiring for the entire world's people. So congratulations for that. So now to come to your question, Prashant. Every country has given us what is called a stimulus package. I mean, in actual fact, if you analyze each and every one of those packages, they are really bailouts for the big corporates, for the banking sector. But even in the most committed capitalist economies, you have had a portion of that package which is directly additional expenditure for the people, <coughs> to put in the pockets of the people. In America, anyway, they've been getting an unemployment allowance. Apart from that, there is a di direct cash transfer. But here in India, in the 10% GDP that the Modi government claims to have spent, as part of that relief package. It's hardly 1%, which is additional expenditure. Less than 2 lakh crore rupees. And the most shocking thing is, you have as much as 870 million tons of food grains rotting in the go-downs of this government. They're spending money to Keep that food grain safe from the rats. The hungry rats which are at the food grain stocks because there's so much of it, they can't even keep it in <coughs> go-downs. We don't have enough go-downs for it. But they're not prepared to distribute it to the people. They are giving bailouts to big corporates. In the last two years, they've given something like over two point, I don't know how many lakh crore rupees. Even now, right now, as we talk, they're working on plans how to wipe off corporate debts to the banks, write them off. And yet they say they don't have money to transfer to the people. Now, apart from the fact that there's no ethics in this policy, there's no morality, there's no, not even iota of humanity. Forget all that. We don't expect these right-wing governments to have that. But it doesn't even make economic sense. Your country, your economy is in a recession. Your consumption expenditures are the lowest it has been for the last two decades. People have no money in their pockets. 
there's a huge de demand side crisis in the economy. Give people money so they can spend and they can boost demand. There's nothing socialist about this. It's, it's just capitalist common sense. Right. But that government is so committed to this so-called deficit and fiscal fundamentalism, mm -hmm. you know, which had been imposed as part of this whole neoliberal framework by international agencies and particularly international rating agencies. So this government is now deciding policies on the basis of international rating agencies, not on the basis of the needs of our people. That is what the protest was about today. Fundamental issues of survival. Absolutely. And we've got a huge response. Right. And, uh... I'll come to the, pro the the details of the protest a bit more, a bit later. But before that, I just wanted to ask you uh, regarding the Modi government's handling of the pandemic itself. So how does the left see how the government's approach to the health sector and to this crisis has been, since it has exposed many things about many governments across the world? You're absolutely right. And I think Modi government, along with Trump and Bolsonaro, and others of that ilk, who refuse to exp accept the danger of this virus, who ignored it. I mean, the WHO had warned about the global pandemic much earlier on. In January, I think it was that the WHO had uh, given that warning to governments across the world. The Modi government didn't start acting until March. And in contrast, in Kerala, where we are running our government, even within this really difficult situation with such a resource crunch, communists in leadership of a state government, a provincial government, have shown that there is an alternative. If you have an alternative political vision, even though your resources are so limited, you can bring relief to the people. So we started on a scientific basis in January itself. And this whole question of testing, of tracing, of identification, of quarantining, the entire methodology, which has now been accepted all over the world as a model, was in Canada. But in complete contrast to that, the Modi government, first of all, didn't recognize it. Secondly, when it did, it didn't prepare the people for a lockdown. I mean, what was in the government's mind? You're in a country with 14 crore migrant workers. They don't even have the correct figures. Even if you take their lower estimate of 8 crores or 80 million, you know, if you look at the entire workforce in India, it's around, uh, I would say, 42 crores, 420 million. So of that, if you say 8 to 10 crores are migrant workers and you impose a lockdown, what were you thinking? What would they do without jobs, without incomes? And the margin between destitution and survival is literally daily work. Without the daily work, undocumented workers in India. So although some governments tried to provide some relief, they showed their no confidence in the Modi government's policies by walking. Lots of workers, women workers, children, men, they picked up their bags and said, your lockdown doesn't work for us. We have to survive. We want to go home. And he started the long walk home. Thousands of kilometers all over the world, those images. Were... And what did the government do? It was totally silent. So one big issue was the non-preparation for the working people of India. It was also at the time, during the lockdown of the harvest, and the government had nothing for the Kisans of India. So that was the second big blow. First the workers, then the Kisans, then the large number of self-employed people, small shopkeepers, street vendors. Where were they? They were left in the lurch. So there were rents to be paid, there were bills to be paid, there was food which had to be bought. What, 
where was the money? So we said, I did provide the cash right now. Transfer the cash, transfer free food grades. Ensure that those who have worked will get their wages. I mean, even countries like Germany and the United Kingdom, when they gave their stimulus to smaller enterprises, they said, this is to pay 70 to 80% of the wages of the workers. Not a pie in India, not a pence, not a cent. So the lockdown and the way it was done was unplanned, it was unthought of, it was callous, it was cruel, it was authoritarian. That's one aspect as far as the people are concerned and every section of the people. And simultaneously, we've also seen that uh, the government has been cracking down on dissent as well. Now, this is nothing new. There's, especially since 2014, when Modi came to, Modi came to power, there's been a very sustained attack on uh, dissidents, on those who are critical of the government. But this lockdown has been especially used uh, to attack the critics and those who have been involved, for instance, in protesting against the citizenship amendment as well. No, you're absolutely right in that. Um, because... There are two aspects. One, as I had mentioned earlier, right-wing governments are trying to use this lockdown to push their sectarian agenda. And here in India, the Bharatiya Janta Party, which is the ruling party, and its mentor or its controller, which is, you know, an extra-constitutional authority, which has a lot of power in India, known as the RSS, which is a fascistic organization built on the, inspired by Hitler and Mussolini. I mean, they don't take say that. So this is not something which, you know, I'm just saying off the top of my head. So this, these two together and all their various affiliated organizations have tried to use the lockdown for two things, basically. One, to push neoliberal reforms. In that you have some sections of the RSS who are a bit wary of it because then so-called nationalism won't take them so far as to totally oppose what the Modi government is doing in selling off the country's assets. But they do make a few noises now and again. So one is the issue of new liberal reforms being pushed, the core of that being the scrapping of all labor laws, which is what the agenda is. All labor laws in India, which we've won since independence. I don't know if your international audience, what they'll think. That today we have governments in India encouraged by the central government, which wants to bring back the 12 hour day and impose it and say, this is the way we're going to get investments. We're going to be leaving China. So anyway, that's one aspect. The second is you have very correctly pointed out, Prashant, is the clamping down on any kind of protest, any kind of dissidence. And this attack on democracy in which very well-known human rights activists, fighters for the poorer sections of Indian society, the socially oppressed, the scheduled castes, the scheduled tribes, the Dalits and Adivasis, fighters for minority rights, they are being identified and they are being called anti-national and thrown into jail. And one of the most dangerous things which is happening right here in the capital of India is the arrest of so many hundreds of people who were in the, if your audience will know that just before the lockdown, there was a huge movement in India on the issue of citizenship and how the Modi government was trying to attach religion and religious identity to the issue of Indian citizenship, which is actually the core of our constitution, which we are so proud of, that there's no religion attached to our state and there's no religion attached to the rights of citizenship. It's absolutely secular. So they wanted to change that, discriminate against Muslims in the main. And now they are trying to target those activists of that citizenship rights movement and link it up with the kind of communal violence that the capital of India saw uh, in February and in March, just before the lockdown. So today my case was there, coincidentally, on the 16th of June. My case had come up in the Delhi High Court in which I had asked for action in January against those BJP leaders, including a union minister, 
who were indulging in hate speech, the kind of toxic language mm -hmm. which we had seen in the capital of India. Since January to June, I'm very sorry to say the courts of India have not found it important enough to even force the government to reply to the petition which they've admitted. So this is an agenda which, you know, they're taking these two together. The attack on people's rights in the form of neoliberal reform and the attack on constitutional guarantees of democracy and dissent and calling everybody anti-national and throwing them into jail, including a young pregnant woman who's a 21-week pregnant young Muslim activist. Absolutely. All right. And uh, finally, to build on two aspects you were mentioning earlier, one is that uh, in one state in India, we saw that uh, even uh, writing red salute comrade is something that would be that could be punishable by law. And simultaneously, we've also seen that there's been a lot of attack and targeting on the left. You mentioned being called anti-national, of course. And then there's a larger question of how during these times we see resistance itself. And you mentioned again one example, which is Kerala, which is which, which has been an example to the world on how do we have an alternative way of dealing with a pandemic in a society. Uh, a question in parallel is how do we visualize resistance at this point of time? And you mentioned the kind of response that today's protest got. There have been a number of other movements by organizations associated with the CPIM in the past couple of months, farmers' movements, trade unions' movements. So seeing all this together, how do you see how do you look at resistance at this point of time itself? It is very difficult to tell you the truth because with COVID cases increasing as they are, you know, we have not even reached the peak yet. And we're already fourth in the world. So there is a huge increase in uh, the infection. And the poor are the most vulnerable because of lack of nutrition, because of lack of the access to health, and particularly women today are among the worst sufferers because it is in this situation where in a patriarchal society like India, they are having to not only increase the huge burden of care work for families who are all locked in together, but at a time when there is no money in the house. So there's so much mental stress and also the vulnerability to infection, worry about the children. It's a horrible situation today for India's poor women, who are the large majority. So there is an objective situation, which on the one hand, you have a critical health emergency in a situation where you do have to take precaution. And on the other hand, you have a government which is not waging a war against the virus, but waging a war against its own people and their rights. So obviously, as communists, we cannot, we will not, and we have not kept silent. So one big part of our work has been relief work, reaching out to lakhs and lakhs of people, donations also from poor people, and professionals who've been so generous in giving relief and helping us. So we, there's not a single area in India where the red flag is not visible in giving relief work to the people. But now we have to move on to the big stage of struggle. And as you have very rightly said, the trade unions, the Kisan movements, women's organizations like AIDWA, the All India Democratic Women's Association, they have been out in the streets. And how are we doing it? We have said, start at the village level, the block level, and reach out to these lakhs of people there. And as we reach out and mobilize them on the very basic demands, which is there for each and every section of our people, the struggle will increase. Now today in a state like Kerala, the reports are that over 10 lakh, that's a million people in one small state of India. One million people were out today, but they observed physical distancing. We totally abhor that word social distancing. Absolutely. It is absolutely unacceptable. So physical distancing, wearing masks and or doing all that. But 
reaching out to the people. And this can only grow. Resistance will grow. We cannot keep silent. Because really, if the COVID's not going to get us, certainly hunger in the Modi government's policies are. Right. So we cannot keep silent on it. So that's the way forward. And I'm extremely encouraged and inspired by the protest today. It was absolutely, you know, in all villages, so many villages across India. And look at the contrast. Here we are out on the streets, and there's the Modi government. Not a pie for the people, but for one state of Bihar to buy these LED screens to have a leader in Delhi addressing a virtual rally. So they spent 144 crore rupees. How many million is that? You please calculate and see. To address 200,000 people. And here we were with not a penny spent, lakhs of people, hundreds and thousands of communists and sympathizers and workers and peasants were out on the streets today. So just as globally in dealing with COVID, there's a difference between socialist countries and capitalist countries. So also in the resistance and the way you do it, you see the red flag and other progressive-minded people and citizens coming out in protest. And you look at these right-wing governments like Modi, who have no money for the people, and they spend hundreds of thousands of rupees to spread their toxic message, not to unite India, but to divide India. Thanks for talking to us. Thank you. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching People's Dispatch. Yeah, I'm